I'm gonna write a sentence on this piece of paper and I want you to tell me if it's true or false. This sentence is false. You might feel that this sentence is like a little bit weird. Something about it's just kind of off. And you would be right about this. This is the liar. And it is at the heart of a paradox that philosophers have been talking about for thousands of years. If you say that the liar is true, you need to ask under what conditions it would be true. And the liar says of itself that it's false. So the only way for it to be true is for it to be false. So since it's true, it's false. And if you say that it's false, well, it turns out the liar has accurately described itself. So if it's false, it's true. Philosophers have known about the liar paradox for thousands of years, but I think it's safe to say that we've still never really solved it. So today we'll talk about the liar paradox. We'll talk about the history of the liar and how philosophers have tried to solve it. I'm Jared Henderson. I'm a philosopher. If you like this video or you like other videos that I've made here on YouTube, consider checking out my Substack. And if you become a paying subscriber, you're helping me bring philosophy content to YouTube. I've said before that we've known about the liar paradox for a really long time. Aristotle discusses it and so does Cicero and medieval theologians identified it as one of their insolubilia. There's even something like the liar paradox in the Bible. If you look at the epistle of Titus in the New Testament, Paul writes that a Cretan prophet says that all Cretans are liars. And Paul says that the Cretan was speaking truly. It's not quite the liar paradox, but it's sort of close. But of course, Aristotle's Organon, where he discusses logic and different kinds of reasoning, is actually much older than Christianity by at least several hundred years. And so we've known about the liar paradox longer than Christianity has existed on this earth. So what exactly is the problem with the liar? In logic, we take sentences, sometimes we call those propositions, but we'll say sentences here, and we assign them truth values. These are ordinary declarative sentences like the cat is on the mat or hot dogs are sandwiches. And we give them truth values to say whether or not they're true or false. Here, one means true and zero means false. Let's use R to stand in for the liar. So R means this sentence is false. Now we're needing to figure out which truth value we're going to assign to it. The problem as we saw earlier though, is that if you give it a one, and thus say that it's true, you can quickly derive that it's false. So it should have actually been assigned zero. But if you assign it zero, you can derive that it's true. So it should have been assigned a one. So that is a contradiction. It means that the same sentence is said to be true and false. And most systems of logic, especially classical logic, say that there are no true contradictions. On top of that, if there is a contradiction, you can actually derive anything through some pretty minimal logical rules. This is called the principle of explosion. And that means suddenly everything is true and everything is false. And of course, that's an absurd conclusion that we want to avoid. So the principle of explosion is one reason why people want to avoid paradoxes. It's sort of one argument for why the liar is so weird. But I think kind of fundamentally what is happening is that the liar just feels unstable. When we look at the liar sentence, we want to say that it's true, and then we want to say that it's false, and we just go back and forth and back and forth. It just feels almost, I, I don't know, when I spent a lot of time thinking about the liar paradox in graduate school, and I would say actually that it just feels unsettling. Hey, Jared, just so you know, Delete Me is sponsoring this video. All right, that's good to know. Um, do I know you? No, nope, but I know you. How'd you find my address? It's on the internet. You see, data brokers take all of your information and then they sell it. And people can use that to steal your identity or to discriminate against you when you're applying for jobs. Or to show up at your house. Exactly. But if you use Delete Me, they can help you remove all of that information from the internet. So how does this work? All you have to do is set up your account with Delete Me. You give them some information and then their experts get to work and they're going to start removing your information from the internet. They'll find and remove your personal information from hundreds of websites. Like my address. And your name, your phone number, your relatives, your social media, all that kind of stuff. And they don't just do it once. They'll keep scanning for an entire year. I do like that. I knew you would. And I think your audience would too. So I just need you to read this. Get 20% off Delete Me U.S. consumer plans when you go to joindeleteme.com slash Henderson and use promo code Henderson at checkout. That's joindeleteme.com slash Henderson, code Henderson. Hey, that's a, that's a pretty good deal. And now, in all seriousness, I use Delete Me to keep my private information off of the internet. And I think you should too. So go to joindeleteme.com slash Henderson, use the code Henderson at checkout, and you can get 20% off a U.S. consumer plan. So we need a solution to the liar, and I said we we're gonna talk about three major solutions. So let's take a look at this sentence again. This sentence is false. Some philosophers say that the problem is right at the beginning. So they say that the problem is the fact that the liar references itself. Others say that the problem has to do with the very end, 
they say the liar is neither true nor false. Others say that the problem is how we think about the whole sentence. These philosophers actually say that there are true contradictions, but that means we have to radically change how we understand logic. So when we were thinking about the liar is that it refers to itself. And when a sentence refers to itself, we just call this self-reference. And if you got rid of self-reference, then the liar sentence wouldn't even be a well-formed sentence. And so we would be able to avoid the paradox pretty easily. So this seems like a decent solution at first, but there are two major problems with it. The first problem is that self-reference is just an ordinary part of English and other natural languages. So look at this example. This sentence is a sentence. I think you can understand this sentence. There's nothing weird about it, but it is self-referential. And that tells us that self-reference is just a part of our language and we know what to do with it in cases that aren't as weird as the liar. There's a complication here though. One of the most famous philosophers and logicians of the 20th century is Alfred Tarski. And so he develops this hierarchical conception of languages. And so you start with your base language, which we call L0. L0 isn't allowed to talk about itself, but then you could have L1, this language right above it, that is allowed to talk about L0. And if you want to talk about L1, you go to L2. And you could just have this infinite hierarchy of languages. And if you have that kind of hierarchy, you do avoid the liar paradox. And that's a pretty nice result. The problem with Tarski's solution, put pretty simply, is that it's a very idealized model of language. Tarski is essentially creating a technical language that can be used for the purposes of mathematics or other kind of formal applications. And so we still might ask, and a lot of philosophers do ask, what about the liar paradox in English as it currently exists? Appealing to some kind of hierarchy of languages, this like super idealized model that Tarski tries, just doesn't work because it's not an accurate description of English. So we said that the first problem here is just that self-reference is a part of natural languages like English, and it's in those natural languages that we discovered the liar paradox. But the second problem is that there are liars that aren't self-referential. So look at this little dialogue. Max says what Agnes says is true, and Agnes says what Max said is not true. This has all the ingredients of a liar sentence, but none of the sentences are self-referential. They reference each other in a cycle. And clearly, being able to reference what other people say is an important part of a language. So you have no self-reference, but you still have the liar paradox. And that tells us that self-reference isn't the root cause of the problem. By the way, we are moving really fast here. And I'm not talking about the history of all of this. I'm not talking about a lot of the formal details or showing you proof systems or model theory for formal logic. And some of you might not even have those basics in propositional logic that would be really useful for a video like this. So what I've done is create a reading guide for you. There's a link down below. I put it on my Substack, but it's totally free. Okay, so self-reference isn't the problem with the liar. So let's go back to our sentence and think about it. The last word here is false. And that's closely, of course, related to the idea of truth. Falsity is like the opposite of truth. Maybe the problem has to do with how we think about truth and falsity. I said before that we assign ordinary declarative sentences in our language, truth values of either one or zero, one for true, zero for false. But a lot of people, when they see the liar, and when I say a lot of people, I really do mean a lot of people. I've asked a lot of people about the liar paradox in my life. When they see the liar, their first assumption is that it's neither true nor false. This is called a gappy solution to the liar. Gappy solutions reject the principle of bivalence, which is the principle that states that all declarative sentences are either true or false. If we give up on bivalence and say that the liar is neither true nor false, then it seems like there's a pretty straightforward solution to the liar. We don't get trapped in any kind of reasoning here because we don't say that it's true or that it's false, which is where kind of all of our problems began. So that might get us around the first instance of the liar, but take a look at this sentence. This sentence is not true. This is called the strengthened liar. Other people sometimes call it the revenge liar, but we'll call it the strengthened liar in this video. So now we ask this question, is the strengthened liar either true or false or neither true nor false? If it's true, then it's not true. And that would mean that it's either false or neither true nor false. And you can't be both true and false or both true and neither true nor false. So we're already getting back into the liar paradox. The same kind of problems arise if you say that it's false and if you say that it's neither true nor false. The strength in liar basically shows that gappy solutions to the liar are insufficient, at least in this really simplified form. Other people have tried to develop more complicated gappy solutions to the liar. That's the kind of thing that you can find in that reading guide. What if we took the gap strategy and reversed it? What if instead of saying that the liar is neither true nor false, we said that it's both true and false? 
that would be a glut strategy. Glut theorists say that there are true contradictions and that the liar is one of them. Though if you look at this book by Graham Priest, he actually argues that you can find gluts even in nature. He points to things like states of motion or cases of vagueness. For the details of those arguments, you would need to check out this book. So while gap theorists give up the principle of bivalence, Glut theorists give up the law of non-contradiction. The law of non-contradiction is very old. One of the first systematic treatments of logic that we have, at least in the West, is from Aristotle, and Aristotle basically just assumes the law of non-contradiction in all of his reasoning. It's sort of a foundational assumption for what he's trying to do. And logicians through history have by and large always assumed the law of non-contradiction. Though not always, there are historical exceptions. Philosophers who reject the law of non-contradiction are called dialetheists. And dialetheists like to point out, and I think they're right about this, that very few people have arguments for the law of non-contradiction. They just assume it because it seems obvious. But I do think that we have to take the idea seriously. There are too many philosophers, especially in modern logic, who have gone to great lengths to show that you can build logical systems that tolerate true contradictions. I even studied under several of them when I was getting my PhD. Here I think we have to confront the problem, that there is something wrong with our language. Dialetheists say that the problem is we assume there are no true contradictions. And while that does seem crazy, they have given fairly thorough defenses, and we actually need to assess those defenses on an individual basis. We need to go through their arguments and see if they hold up. I used to have this reaction to think that dialetheism is just like obviously stupid. But then I went to graduate school and I met people who earnestly believed in dialetheism and were working it out as logicians. They are professional philosophers who spend their life thinking about these issues. And I had to at least take dialetheism seriously. I'm not totally convinced, but I'm at least open to the idea that dialetheism is true. But I think the best argument still against dialetheism is that any kind of logic that can tolerate true contradictions is going to be very, very weak. The logic that is often discussed in literature is called LP, which is the logic of paradox. If you want to learn about LP, again, it's in that reading guide I've mentioned. Logics like LP are called para-consistent logics. They are logics that can handle inconsistencies without explosion. Other logics which are stronger than LP, so they can prove more, have to be incredibly complicated. And so you start to wonder if all of this effort is worth it just for the sake of defending a rather crazy philosophical position. The objection to dialetheism that I still take seriously is that you have to give up a lot to be a dialetheist, and it takes a lot of theoretical work to make sense of the view, but it's not totally clear what the benefits of the position are. But these aren't like knockdown decisive arguments. This is weighing the various pros and cons of different solutions. But of course, any solution to the liar paradox is going to be weird because it's going to mean that we have to reject something about the way that we think about truth and logic and language. I think at this point in a YouTube video, I am supposed to offer my own solution. And that provides a nice resolution to the whole video. But the title of the video, at least when I'm releasing it at first, is The Ancient Paradox We Still Can't Solve. Even though I tried to think about the liar paradox since about halfway through undergrad all the way through graduate school, I don't feel like I ever really made progress on the issue. I used to be kind of upset by the fact that I don't think I've solved the liar paradox, but then I realized I think almost no one in history has solved the liar paradox. I'm in pretty good company as a philosopher, at least. Human language and human thought is messy. The way we talk and think about the world is strange, and trying to put it into a formal system can always lead to some weird results. But there is always more to learn. And if you want to learn more, there's that free reading guide down below.